Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We're studying a Sabbath School series now on the book of Isaiah, and we're getting down toward the end of it. This is lesson number 11 for March 13 of 2021, entitled Waging Love. Not waging war, ra waging love. Hmm. I wonder what that means. Well, as usual, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we believe that you're, the very basis of your government is love. Everything about you is love, and it's a love that's beyond anything we can really imagine. But now waging love? What does that mean? Well, let's have a look at these passages in Isaiah and see if we can figure it out. Guide us in our discussion together. We thank you for your presence among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Yeah. amen. Isaiah 55 and 58, which we'll be studying pri primarily uh, in this lesson, are great chapters in the Old Testament because they discuss what God actually wants of his people. What God actually wants of his people. Imagine that. Jim? Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3. The Lord says, Come, everyone who is thirsty, here is water. Come, you that have no money, buy corn and eat. Come, buy wine and milk. It will cost you nothing. Why spend money on that which does not satisfy? Why does your, why spend your wages and still be hungry? Listen to me and do what I say, and I will, and you will enjoy the best food of all. Listen to now, my people, and come to me. Come to me, and you will have life. I will make a lasting covenant covenant with you, and give you the blessings I promised to David. That's it. American Bible Society, 1992. In a society where almost everything depends on having money to buy things, what is God trying to tell us by saying that we can buy without any money? What kind of strange proposal is that? God wants to offer us something whose value is beyond the wildest imagination of any human, and he offers it free. But there is still a transaction. Something of worth is transferred. God offers forgiveness free. However, it cost them an enormous price, the life and death of the Son. we we'll go back to verse 3. It says, listen, my people. Mm -hmm. uh, all through the Old Testament, God is complaining that the people don't want to listen. And he says, if you listen, you'll have life. It must have something to do with the way we process information, doesn't it? Something to do with thinking. Yeah. What about that? Similar passages in the New Testament in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Let me just read that really quickly. For you know what was paid to set you free from the worthless manner of life handed down by your ancestors. It was not something that can be destroyed, such as silver or gold. It was the costly sacrifice of Christ, who was like a lamb without defect or flaw. Um... And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says something similar, make it clear that God's free gift is worth far more than silver or gold or anything else in this world. Isaiah helps us to recognize that there was not a separate old covenant, salvation by works, which was then superseded by the new covenant, salvation by grace. There's only one way to salvation. In ancient times, there are myth stories told about people like Gilgamesh and others who did heroic exploits, vainly seeking for eternal life. In modern times, some groups have begun to promote the idea of reincarnation, but it also is fruitless. Salvation? Charles? Salvation is free in that there's nothing we can do to earn it. Our works can never be good enough to save us. Yet, at the same time, it can cost us everything. What does that mean? Okay, we're going to look at Matthew 10, 59, 39. And Jesus said, those who try to gain their own life will lose it. But those who lose it, lose their life for my sake, will gain it. Wow. You lose your life, you gain it. Well, you this is backwards. <laughs> Didn't the Christian martyrs down through the ages pay a big price for their Christianity? Yes. 
while salvation is free, having, living a Christian life may cost you everything. Now, how about that? Carrie, you have something more on that? I like to yeah. substitute, the, any time they see the word salvation or save, yeah. substitute the word health or heal. Yeah. And it makes a lot more sense. I'm reading from chapter 9 of Luke, verse 23. And he, Jesus, said to them all, Anyone who wants to come with me must forget self, take up their cross every day, and follow me. That's now, from the Good News Bible. And I want to ask you the question which I have there on this page. What in the world did the disciples think Jesus was talking about when he mentioned the cross? They had no, no. I mean, you, you, the only people who died on the cross were traitors to the Roman government. Yeah. Why would Jesus talk about, well, we know why, but what did they think? It, when Jesus mentioned the cross. It, to me, it means, I give you the salvation, that's free. But you keep it, that's gonna cost you. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, right. Yeah, if you want to keep it, it's gonna cost you. So the folk who are talking about, once you're saved, you cannot be unsaved. Yeah, no. That's the whole Christian world is saying yes, that. Exactly. Except some crazy Adventists. Yeah. But now think about this. They had joined Jesus because they were, they were hoping to be the cabinet in the next Judean government that was going to rule the world. That was their, their, their mental thinking. That's what they, they really believed was going to happen. And now Jesus is talking about a cross? <laughs> I mean, did they think maybe they, some of them might lose their lives because as they're fighting the Romans? <laughs> I mean, what did they think? Even to the cross itself, they yeah. thought that he was going to play a trick. Yeah. Well, at that, at, when Jesus is doing this talking here, uh, John the Baptist was already gone. lost his head, didn't he? Uh, yes. John, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Continuing, I'm reading Luke 14, verse 26. Jesus said, those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and themselves as well. And that's from the Good News Bible. Wow. I mean, we are getting all sorts of crazy ideas here. What would you say to someone who came to you with this proposal? You know, forget your wife, forget your kids. Well, no, I didn't really say that. We just says, Love me more than you love any of them? What was Jesus actually trying to say to us in this verse? It certainly does not mean that we should stop loving our family members. There's lots of reasons in the Bible why we should love our family members. But our commitment to God and His cause must take priority over every other commitment. Even if everyone around us rejects the truth, we must stand firmly in its favor. However, having said that, even dying a martyr's death is a small price to pay for eternal life with God in the earth made new. What could, could you plug in uh, John 17, 3 into that? Oh, 17, sure. 3 mm. and 4? Yeah. Eternal life this is to know the Father, right, right, right. And know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Well, look, St. Peter, about Paul, perhaps he never, they were probably about the same time. Yeah. Jesus and Paul. Yeah. Here he's a man who single-handedly wanted to stop this nonsense, Christianity. And look at what had happened. He saw the cross in its real divine beauty, and yeah. wow. Yeah. Well, look at it took him a while. It, yeah. took it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 even even the, uh, what has been referred to like the two by four on, on the road, road to Damascus. Yeah. It still took him a while to yeah. finally sort those things. He had a lot of data, didn't he? Yeah. He was probably a good student of the old. old he probably had the Old Testament memorized yeah. in Hebrew. Yeah. But it still took him time to sort that thing and build it into a model. We, of, we call that a fruit basket upset. Yeah. <laughs> That's the time he spent in Arabia. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Well, Philippians 3 8 adds to that not only those things, I reckon everything is complete loss for the sake of what is so much more valuable. And, and Paul gave up his family. He gave up his wife. Wow. The knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for his sake I have thrown everything away. I consider it all as mere refuse so that I may gain Christ. And I, I suspect that Paul could have been quite wealthy. His family, I'm sure, was wealthy. Yeah. 
He was a member of the Sanhedrin? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very learned man. Yes. Very early in Christian yes. Christianity, when it was nonsense, yeah. you see, that he turned. Yeah. Well, look at Isaiah 55, 6 to 13. Turn to the Lord and pray to him now that he is near. Let the wicked leave their way of life and change their way of thinking. Let them turn to the Lord our God. He is merciful and quick to forgive. My thoughts, says the Lord, are not like yours, and your, my ways are different than yours. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. My word is like the snow and the rain that come down from the sky to water the earth. They make the crops grow and provide seed for sowing and food to eat. So also will be the word that I speak. It will not fail to do what I plan for it. It will do everything I send it to do. You will leave Babylon with joy. Now let's stop for a second and talk about the issues here. Isaiah lived from about 740 to about 680 BC. Babylon didn't become a significant force until 605 or 609, 605, somewhere in there. And so this is many years, a hundred years before Babylon was anything. And look at, he's talking about Babylon. Mm. You will leave Babylon with joy. You will be led out of the city in peace. The mountains and hills will boast, burst into singing and the trees will shout for joy. Cypress trees will grow where now there are briars. Myrtle trees will come up in place of thorns. This will be a sign that will last forever, a reminder of what I, the Lord, have said. Many wow. people went though, not a whole lot, but many people, what, three times they went back, returned, at least. What percentage? Twice. No, I think it's a very low percentage at that point. Yeah. Yeah, like but. Two, one or two percent. There you are, right, right. But maybe they left with joy. Yeah. And they risked their lives going. Yeah, I think the ones who went back were happy to go back. Yes. Well, what is God implying by saying that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts? Surely none of us would suggest that we are in some kind of an equal plane with God. After all, he spoke the entire universe into existence. As we study things more carefully, we discover that even some of the simplest things, even the simplest forms of life, are complicated far beyond our ability to grasp. And some of you may be aware of a very famous, world famous, a chemical engineer. You know what a chemical engineer does? A chemical engineer is the one who, who can figure out how to make any kind of chemical thing you want to, want to make. Using this or that or the other, if you want a certain molecule in a certain shape, they know how to do it. Well, this man, his name is James Tour, and I would encourage any of you who have an opportunity, uh, look him up on, uh, he's on YouTube, James Tour. T-O-U-R? T-O-U-R, just like okay. a, taking a tour, yeah. Okay. And he will explain to you why it would it was it would be completely impossible for the even the simplest cell to have happened by chance. Completely impossible. He says uh, evolutionists are clueless. Yeah. You know, just just let them try doing it using chemical engineering. Well, their impossible. presupposition clouds yeah. their. Uh yeah. Understanding. Well, I mean, Darwin, he thought the cell was sort of a, a, a wall with some, some gunk inside, you know. Well, but this infinitely great and wonderful God who has all those powers chose to live with us. Mm. Jim? Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. I am the high and holy God who lives forever. I live in a high and holy place, but I also live with people who are humble and repentant so that I can restore their confidence and hope. That is, he will live with us if we are humble. But God does not intend to save us in our sins or with our sins. He intends to save us from our sins. And so he challenges us to leave our wicked ways. Well, that's why sin in the Old Testament is a disease. Yeah. And that's why you need healing. Yeah. You don't need forgiveness for your, for, uh, your illness. Well, we have another name for it, but yeah. 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 Really, we need to be healed. Yeah. Charles? Yes, sir. The theme of redemption. No, I, I, I think that one's mine. Oh, is it? I'm sorry. Uh, Isaiah 55, 6 to 9. Uh -huh. Turn to the Lord and pray to him now that he is near. Let the wicked leave their 
way of life and char excuse me and change their way of thinking. He let them turn to the Lord our God. He is merciful and quick to forgive. Change their way of thinking. Hmm. Well, what have we got? Is that Philippians two? Let yeah. your mind be in you yeah. as it is in Christ Good Jesus. Christ. And think he, like we, God. Yeah. Right. Can we possibly comprehend that love that God has shown to the human race and what he has done and what, what he will do in the future on our behalf? But there is more. Charles? The theme of redemption is one of the angels' desire, is one that the angels desire to look into. It will be the science and the song of redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Now, I want to interrupt there for a second. If it's going to be the science and song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages, and the angels want to know about it, so that's going to be, we're going to be talking about redemption and the plan of salvation for the rest of eternity. Well, how, how does that relate to the people who think that, okay, when we go to heaven, all thoughts, every evidence of the past is going to be gone. You know, you've heard this story about the little girl who goes up to Jesus. How did you get those nail point prints in your hands? Well, I'm sorry, I, can't, I don't remember. <laughs> I think there's grown ups are going to be asking, so what are those marks in your hands? Yeah. You know, and I want to think that the redeemed will also share, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. I That's think what Paul, they'll do. To hear Paul present his case, I think it's going to be yeah. awe inspiring. Is it not worthy of careful thought and study now? The subject is inexistible. The study of the incarnation of Christ, his atoning sacrifice, the meditorial work will employ the mind of the diligent student as long as time shall last. And looking to heaven with its un unnumbered years, he will exclaim, great is the mystery of godliness. Wow. Ellen White, my life today, 360, three and four. But we must never forget that the great controversy did not start here on planet Earth. It did not start here on planet Earth. It is true that we got caught up in it very early in human existence, but the truth about God had to be demonstrated before the entire universe, before the great controversy could be won. I want you to think about this for a moment. Who was it? Think about Calvary. Think about Christ dying there on the cross. Who saw what was actually happening there? Not a single human being. It was in, completely shielded for, in total blackness. None of us human. And the reason for that is none of us had a clue what was going on. So God says, let me just put, put the blackness over here. Yeah. But who did see it? God saw it. Jesus saw it as he was dying. The heavenly universe saw it. Satan and all his angels saw it. They're the ones who saw it. And that was, that was the key. Now, we have since learned about what happened there. But we're, anyway, we're very late into this game. Charles? No, it's me. I'm a Carrie, I'm sorry. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. <coughs> angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make him visible and familiar to their eyes. Let me interrupt for a second. <coughs> to set men right, what's another word for that? The technical sort of legal jargon Justified. and a lot of Christianity, that's justification. Keeping men right, what is that? That's sanctification. That's sanctification. We don't need to use those long words. We can have simple ones. Set men right. Keep them right. Yeah. Okay, Charles. Uh, Charles. I no, that's Carrie. all right. Carrie. Yeah. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. 
In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfection of the Father. Uh, in his prayer just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father had made, was made manifest to men. That's from Ellen G. White, The Signs of the Times, in 1890, paragraph 6 Nine. Wow. Mm. Incredible. And why isn't that being repeated everywhere? Only one time that I can think of yep. back in the last 50 years. Yep. We like to focus on what God has done for us, especially me, you understand, me and you too, of course. Well, while it is true that what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have done for us is of immeasurable value, the angels in heaven and the entire rest of the universe need to see what Jesus demonstrated. It was in order that the heavenly universe, I'm quoting from Mellon White now, it was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. The throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the race be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. Guess how many times that's quoted? If you think salvation and the plan of salvation is all about saving human beings, no. The, the truth about God has to be presented at all costs, even in wiping out the entire human race. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled, and the human race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth? his trial in the judgment hall, his crucifixion, who witnessed these scenes? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels, and where were we? Hiding in a locked room upstairs for fear that we would be next. Helen White, Signs of the Times, July 12, 1899. We're going to add a couple of uh, Bible texts. We've got Colossians 1, 19 yep. and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and 3, 9 and 10, yep. that Jesus' death was for the benefit of the looking universe, yep. the angels. And you'd be surprised how many Adventist pastors don't understand that. Yeah. Christ died for sinless angels too, Jim. That which, excuse me, that which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent <laughs> sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. The plan of, her, of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. An eternal safeguard. What does that mean? It's necessary. It's, it's it. You got to have it. It's, it's, it's a okay, protection. Okay. What, what does the universe learn from this? From the death of Christ, that Jesus never advocated the killing of anybody. He says so, uh, he had a message of love uh, that was could only be demonstrated. And that's what he, that's what he did. What okay, does he say? Uh, what was the passage? I'm, I'm I'm going to put that in a little different world, words. What he demonstrated was the truth about Satan. Sinfulness, oh, yes, sinfulness of sin. Yes, the sinfulness okay? of sin, the right. consequences of sin. Right. That the, nobody had really, really... This, Jesus is the only one in the history of our world so far who actually died the second death. 
He died the death which results from sin, a direct result from sin. Not heart attack, not stroke, not loss of blood, not crucifixion. He died of separation from the source of life, his father. His humanity was separated. And I think that's what really frightened him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was afraid that he, right. sin was so offensive to God that he would be eternally separated from his father. So, and the, the universe looking on needed to see that. They needed to see what Satan was doing to Christ, and they needed to see the response from the Father, and they needed to see how awful sin is in its consequences. And all of that is a process of education. Yeah. It, no quick uh, fix. fix. It's, it's no, a process. No, no. So do we really want to be a part of God's marvelous plan? Are we willing to give up all the hurtful things that damage us and make it hard for us to accept God's plan for us. God has done everything possible to save us. What are we willing to do for him? Isaiah 58, one through eight, the Lord says, shout as loud as you can. Tell my people Israel about their sins. They worship me every day, claiming that they are eager to know my ways and obey my laws. They said they want me to give them just laws that they take pleasure in worshiping me. The people ask, why should we fast if the Lord never notices? Why should we go without food if he pays no attention? The Lord says to them, the truth is that at the same time as you fast, you pursue your own interests and oppress your workers. Your fasting makes you violent and you quarrel and fight. Do not think this kind of fasting will make me listen to your prayers. When you fast, you make yourself suffer. You bow your heads low like a blade of grass and spread out sackcloth and ashes to lie on. Is that what you call fasting? Do you think I will be pleased with that? The kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. Then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. Good news Bible, beautifully put together. Yes. Now, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in a bit, but this context is talking about when was it that they blew the, the shofar and fasted? As the a Day of Atonement. As a people. Yes. Yeah. The Day of Atonement. And why were they fasting? They were thankful for the forgiveness that the Lord was offering through that plan, that, that simple, very concrete kind of plan that he was, he was talking to them about. So what is the fast referred to in Isaiah 58, 3? A careful search through the scriptures demonstrates that there's only one fast commanded by God in all of scripture. And that's in Leviticus 16. It refers back to it in Leviticus 23. And I'm not going to read those. Well, I can read these first two verses. The following regulations are to be observed for all time to come. On the tenth day of the seventh month, the Israelites and the foreigners who live among them must fast and must do, must not do any work. And that's the, that's the, talking about the, the Day of Atonement. And then dropping down to 31, that day is to be a very holy day, one of which they fast and do no work at all. These regulations are to be observed for all time to come. So, and this must be the, I'm sorry, Charles? Jim. Gary. Gary, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We pretty much covered it with what you say, but I'll, I'll go ahead. This must be the fast of the Day of Atonement, the only fast commanded by God. And again, they mentioned Le uh, Leviticus 16, 29, 31, Leviticus 23, 27 to 32. This is confirmed in Isaiah 
58 verse 3 by the parallel expression humble ourselves which follows the terminology of Leviticus, humbling or afflicting oneself referred to various forms of self-denial, included, including rather fasting. And they give you some more texts. Compare Psalms 35, 13, Daniel 10, 2, 3, and 12. Mm -hmm. Now, before you go ahead and read Leviticus 16, 29, and 31 again, let's, uh, let's talk about this. So to us, way down here, far away from the Jewish ceremonies and so forth, it may not be obvious, but to a Jew who was there practicing this, when you talk about blowing the shofar trumpet, and when you talk about fasting, immediately his mind was supposed to go to what? The Day of Atonement. Yeah. That was the ceremony that, they, that God's fast that he was talking about. So now Isaiah is referring to those things, and what is he hoping that, that people will see? The true meaning. They will, that they will come back to realize what was supposed to happen, the true meaning through the plan of, uh, through the Day of Atonement. You want to go ahead and read that again? The following regulations? I think, Jim, haven't you no. got? Go ahead, Leviticus. Now, which one have we got? I've got... Right below where you were. The one that's on the screen there, Leviticus. Okay. Leviticus 16, 29 and 31. The following regulations are to be observed for all time to come. On the tenth day of the seventh month, the Israelites and the foreigners living among them must fast and must not do any work. That day is to be a very holy day, one on which they fast and do no work at all. These regulations are to be observed for all time to come. From yeah. the Good News Bible. Okay, here's a commentary on that. It comes from uh, our Adventist Bible commentary. Leviticus 16, 29, a statute forever. The Day of Atonement was the only fast day of the year and was called the fast, Acts 27, 9. Other fasts added later were not required or approved by God. And there's others, for example, this one we've talked about here. Uh, Zechariah 7, 3 to 10. In the time of Christ, there were 29 fasts in addition to two weekly fast days. Now, who was it that observed the two weekly fast days? Do you remember? Le the Levites or the priests? No, no, no. This was a special honor for the Pharisees. Oh. The Pharisees, oh, we fast. Remember that he said, I fast twice a week. Yeah, I fast twice a week. Imagine, fa now this didn't mean total abstinence from food, but they were so, it was supposed to mean uh, afflicting your souls. This was more than fasting. It included soul searching, a review of one's progress and holy living, a seeking of God, confession of sin, making amends for neglected duties, squaring accounts with God and men, thus redeeming the time, okay? They made it a show business. Yeah. It's been said that uh, to, uh, to fast that way is to make you hangry. <laughs> hangry, <laughs> yeah. And you read one of those texts earlier that it's yeah. kind of in that nature that... Uh, yeah. When we recognize that Isaiah was take, talking about Day of Atonement, we see why he said, lift up your voice like a trumpet, Isaiah 51. This trumpet refers to the shofar, or a ram's horn trumpet, blown on the first day of the seventh month, calling the people to the ceremonies of the Day of Atonement. On one very special year, the 50th year, what's that called? Jubilee. The year of Jubilee, a second shofar announced that was, announcement was made on the 10th day of the seventh month. So on that particular year, it was on the first day of the seventh month, and then nine days later on the tenth day of the seventh month. Is this the Nissan? Nissan or Seven, that's... Uh, no, just yeah, I think up. so, yeah. I think it's the Nissan. Recognizing that the entire year was set aside. What was it set aside for? Levit Leviticus 23, 23 and 44. On the first day of the seventh month, observe a special day of rest and come together for worship when the trumpets sound. Good News Bible. Leviticus 25, 9 and 10. Then, on the tenth day of the seventh month, the Day of Atonement, send someone to blow a trumpet throughout the whole land. In this way you shall set the fiftieth year apart and proclaim freedom to all the inhabitants of the land. During this year, all property that 
has been sold shall be restored to the original owner or his descendants. And anyone who has been sold as a slave shall return to his family. Also it's from the Good News Bible. Yeah. So while there was only one fast commanded by God in all of the Bible, there were multiple other fasts practiced by the children of Israel at different times. So what was the fast described in Isaiah 58, 3 to 7? What is it that God wanted in place of their fast? Freedom. Justice. Right. Yeah, be nice to one another. What kind of injustices might we be guilty of in our day? Is God calling for us to correct our injustices today? A careful look at Isaiah 58 seems to suggest that the people were expecting the Lord to congratulate them for their piety. <laughs> of course, that was a complete contradiction to what they were supposed to be doing on the Day of Atonement. They were supposed to humble themselves to practice self-denial, expressing their gratitude and loyalty to him for the forgiveness that he had given them for the sins committed during the entire previous year. Not saying, look at us, God, look what we're doing, we're fasting just because you want us to. No, we're supposed to be saying, thank you, Lord, so much for the forgiveness that you've offered us. They had it completely backwards. On the Day of Atonement, there was that extensive ceremony for removing sins from the tabernacle and separating them from God's people forever. And I, we recognize, of course, that this was a fairly concrete, maybe even childish in some respects, ceremony. But I, I want you to think of how you would feel if you really believed that your sins got transferred from you to the Lamb, the priest collected the blood, he carried it into the, into the holy place there, and then on that day, he would go in, he would collect those sins, he would bring them out, he would put them on the head of that scapegoat, mm -hmm. and the scapegoat would be led away, and you could watch. And I, I, I'm sure that the children, that their parents said, look, there it goes. Our sins are gone, and we will never see them again. Mm -hmm. Think about the implications of that. Well, uh, we don't have time to read all of Isaiah 58, 1 to 12 again. I would encourage you to do that. Let me just read the first couple of verses there. The Lord says, shout as loud, shout as, loud as you can. Tell my people of Israel about their sins. They worship me every day, claiming that they are eager to know my ways and obey my laws. They say they want me to give them just laws and that they take pleasure in worshiping me. And then we've already discovered, uh, discussed some of the crazy things they were actually doing. Apparently, Isaiah was making a point on the very day when the Day of Atonement was supposed to be celebrated. Imagine. This is implied by his saying, shout as loud as you can, tell my people of Israel about their sins. That's what was supposed to be, that's what everybody was supposed to be shouting about on the Day of Atonement, right? Mm. That was a message that announces ceremonies of the Day of Atonement. Once again, Isaiah talked about what really matters in the life of God's followers. Is it a religious ritual? Or does it mean completely changing the way we live? The lifestyle. Wow. Carrying on religious practices has been done in many ways by many peoples down through history. Even if we have the right rituals at the right time, with all the right formulas, it does not make us true followers of Christ. In order to be true followers of Christ, we must be willing to follow his example, his life and example as closely as possible. Are we willing to do that? Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to go out and get crucified. The life and death of Jesus Christ gives us a choice. We can live as far as possible with the Holy Spirit's help, like Jesus lived, or we shall die separated from God. And that's the kind of death that Jesus died there on the cross, mm -hmm. resulting in that awful second death, the way Jesus died. God is asking us to preach and to practice the example of Jesus to all around us. Are we doing that? Are we capable of doing that? In Isaiah 58, God through Isaiah made some startling promises. Do you think this, is, this implies that God intends to bless us by supernatural acts? Or is he just telling us that we will naturally be blessed when we are kind to others and stop being selfish, greedy, and self-absorbed? 
And you, nobody's going to respond to that. <laughs> Having discussed the Day of Atonement and its implications at some length, why did Isaiah turn suddenly in Isaiah 58, 13, and 14 to talking about the Sabbath? You know, every Friday evening as the kids were growing up, yeah. they used to have the food, the little candle growing. And, yeah. But, you know, that many folk would. And then would hold hands and go over uh, the fourth commandment and this one, Isaiah yes. 58, 13, and 14. Yeah. The Lord says, if you treat the Sabbath as sacred and do not pursue your own interests on this day, if you value my holiday and honor it by not traveling, working, or talking idle, idly on that day, then you will find your joy that comes from serving me. I'll make you honored all over the world, and you will enjoy the land I gave to your ancestors, ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. Good news, man. Now, I don't know how many of you out there actually grew up in an Adventist home. I did, and Sabbath was the best day of the week, without a question. I mean, the rest of the week, you do all the things you have to do and so forth like this, but when the Sabbath comes, you have to do a lot of things on Friday to get ready, but when the Sabbath comes, it's time to do things with the family, it's time for Dad to be home instead of working, it's time to celebrate and go to, go to church and see your friends at Sabbath school and so forth like that. That's a very special kind of a thing. I like the translation that says, if you call the Sabbath a delight, mm -hmm. the Lord's holy day honorable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We, we need to remember that the word Sabbath means rest. So the yearly day of atonement was a Sabbath day, or a Sabbath year, if you will. And on that yearly Sabbath, the Jews were supposed to set aside their normal work just as they were expected to do during the weekly Sabbath. They were not supposed to work in their fields. They were supposed to let everything just grow up naturally. I, I can imagine the first. And we do, do we know if that was ever actually practiced by all the people, all the Jews? Mm -hmm. Is there any reverence, evidence in Scripture that they actually... I'm sure there were some who did. Some faithful people probably did this. I want to think Daniel, his family, Maybe. did it. Yeah. Yes. Well, but well, wasn't Daniel a part of the priestly families? No, Daniel was one of the princes. Princes, you, okay. From the president. Well, well, uh, from the what I was trying to make family. is maybe he didn't have to do a lot of physical work. Well, he wasn't from the immediate family. He would be, but, you know. Mm. Well, Another reason for believing that these two Sabbaths were to be treated similarly is Leviticus 23, 32. Is the weekly Sabbath similar to that atonement, Day of Atonement Sabbath and that year of Sabbaths? And we read Leviticus 23, 32, from sunset until the ninth day of the month to sunset on the tenth, observe this day as a special day of rest during which nothing may be eaten. So this is one of the clearest verses in the Bible supporting what? Uh, Sabbath when it starts and when it ends. Okay, so why why did God choose to ask the day to choose ha have the day begin at sunset? Creation. Well, but he could have he could have done it any way he wanted it. Creation. There's a very there are two very specific reasons why it must be this way. I don't know why people don't talk more about this. Maybe in him rest comes first. <laughs> Well, okay, that's a possibility. Okay, let me tell you the reasons I think that God chose this. There are only two days in the whole daily cycle that the ordinary person without a watch, without any form of time, can tell exactly when it happens. It either has to be sunrise or sunset. Everybody knows, okay, gone. The sun is gone. That's sunset. So that was, he could tell everybody that, and there wouldn't be any argument. You couldn't say, well, you know, I, you know, this, that, the other. No. Sunset, boom, it's gone. That's it, finished. So that way everybody would be on the same plane. There could be no argument about when the Sabbath began, number one. Number two, I don't know, maybe it wasn't as bad in those days, but I suspect that it was. Today, if, if you said, okay, the Sabbath begins at midnight or Sabbath begins at sunrise or something like this, there are a lot of wonderful Christian women 
Adventist women particularly, who would be working away late into the night on Friday, trying to get ready for the Sabbath. And the next morning they're in church, <sighs> cooking all the goodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so God says, no, you have to have everything ready before sunset. Yeah. So that you can relax this evening, you can get a good night's rest, you can come up in the morning rested and refreshed and ready for enjoying the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. I think there are very solid reasons why God chose sunset as the beginning of the day. Very good so reason. So God said, chose sunset, the church chose midnight. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, 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 yeah, the whole system has changed around, but we need to stick with the sunset. Thing. Amen. So this is another example of the fact that God gave us our days beginning at sunset and continuing to the following sunset. So having read Isaiah 58, 13, which we just read, what is supposed to happen on Sabbath? Do we make our Sabbath like what we read in Isaiah 58, 13, and 14? Are our Sabbaths marked by self-denial and social kindness? What would happen if we said on the Sabbath morning, okay, everybody, instead of coming to church on this Sabbath morning, is going to go out and do something good for a non-Adventist, for a non-Christian, for someone in the community? Ever wondered what, how it happened? Now, that's not worshiping God in the, in the traditional sense, but what do you think? Some of it is going on. I saw that in a church paper recently somewhere. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so, what's the relationship between self-denial, social kindness, and the Sabbath? Well, all three of these do involve concentration on God, His priorities, and recognition of our dependence upon them. If we do as God directs on those days, we will be pursuing our goal of being more like Jesus. Well, where are we here? Look at those ties, I think, Carrie. Look at these other ties between the themes of self-denial, social kindness, and the Sabbath as depicted in Isaiah 58. Sabbath freedom from weekly toil is kind to people because it lets them be refreshed. And they're quoting Exodus 23:12 and Mark 2:27 there. Jesus showed that kind acts are appropriate on the Sabbath. And they're quoting Mark 3 verses 1 to 5, John 5 verses 1 to 17. True Sabbath keepers bring joy then they, they quote Isaiah 58, 14, as does helping others, Isaiah 58, 10 and 11. What must change in your own life in order to experience these blessings yourself? That's from our Bible study guide. It's clear that during his lifetime on this earth, Jesus went out of his way to show us what should happen on the Sabbath. His life was filled with deeds of kindness and loving service. And now I'd like us to take a moment, look at John 5, and I'm hoping you're, we don't have enough time to spend a lot of time uh, doing the whole thing, but whenever I read John 5, 1 to 17, I notice a couple of interesting things in, in uh, let's just go here, I don't know why my machine is not taking me, let's just do this, hold on a second. After this, Jesus went to the Jerusalem for a religious festival. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool with five porches, and Hebrews, Hebrew it is called Bethsatha. Now in the King James, it says Bethsaida. Yeah. Bethsaida means grace or kindness, something like that. Nobody would have named a place like that in Jerusalem by that kind of name. That area in Jerusalem was clearly called Bethsatha. So, and that's the, that's the place of olives. Bethsath is a, the house of olives, okay? A large crowd of sick people were lying in the porches, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And then you see two, a, a tiny little K and an L, and suddenly we skip from verse 3 to verse 5. Why is that? Well, look at this. Some manuscript add verse 3b, they were waiting for the water to move, and then some add verse 4, because every now and then an angel of the Lord went down into the pool and stirred up the water. The first sick person to go into the pool after the water was stirred up was healed from whatever disease he had. 
I think one translation says it was thought that an angel. Yeah, well, that's actually from Desire of Ages. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what's happening here? What's going on here? Here are all these people hoping to get well. And so they see the water stir a little bit, and who's the first one to get in? The one who's the most stable. But go yeah, ahead. these would be these would be the people who probably have a psychological problem to start out with. They have no physical problem. So here's this guy who's been lying there for years and years who can't move. How is he ever going to beat these yeah. speed demons getting in the pool? But, but what really happened? But more than that, okay, do you think God would set up a thing like this, yeah. arbitrary thing like this, sending an angel down to stir the water to see who can be the quickest one no. to jump in? Like a lottery. No, no it, that's crazy. completely crazy. It's, uh, it's absolutely nuts. So this is, a, this, is, this is, so what's happening here, those little parts that got left out here were almost certainly put in the margin because someone who had never been to Jerusalem and didn't know about that belief, they would say, what, what, what's going on here? I don't understand this. So probably some person later said, probably in the margin wrote what we have in, that I just read you from those two things. And then later someone said, well, you know what? People aren't going to understand this story unless that information is there, so they just put it in the text. <laughs> so the oldest manuscripts don't have those verses, but the later manuscripts do have them. Is that why some of our amateurs will mention Muslim brothers will say, it's corrupted. Yeah, well. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. not, don't, tell I, me I how agree with you. Yeah. 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 A man was there who had been ill for 38 years, and you know the rest of the story. Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that the man had been ill for such a long time. So he asked him, do you want to get well? And of course, he told him to pick up his mat, which was completely against the, the problem, completely against the law, because it was a... On Sabbath day. It was Sabbath. Yes. Yeah. And I oh, think man. the Lord enjoyed taunting them, but yeah. that's my translation. <laughs> wow, come on. <laughs> you mean the Lord might want them to actually think about what was supposed to happen on the Sabbath, it's maybe? Like, tried to educate. Everything <laughs> Jesus yeah. did was to educate. I think he educate. tried to educate and agitate. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of leaving those notes in the margin, later copyists included them in the text. What does that say to us about the inspiration of scriptures? Well, it means that the whole story needs to be included. Right. Uh, there's, that's, that's fine. Yeah. The second, or put it back in the margin if you want, like, like my translation does, put it at the, at the footnote, you know, that's okay. The second thing that always amuses me is that when the Jewish authorities questioned the man about who it was that had performed such a miracle, yeah. they, they certainly knew without any question at all in their minds who was the only person in Jerusalem who could perform <laughs> such a miracle. But they wanted the evidence to try to do what? Trap him somewhere. Nail him. Jesus. Him. Nail Jesus. Yeah. We want, here's this guy, look at this guy. He was healed by Jesus yeah. on the Sabbath, can you imagine? Well, wasn't it nice that he healed? Well, we don't care about his getting healed. That's he did it on the Sabbath. <laughs> Get him. And then we got that load of help. Oh, brother. Okay, Jim. No one can practice real benevolence without self-denial. Only by a life of simplicity, self-denial, and close economy is it possible for us to accomplish the work appointed us as Christ's representatives. Pride and worldly ambition must be put out of our hearts. In all our work, the principle of unselfishness revealed in Christ, in Christ's life is to be carried out Upon the walls of our homes, the pictures, the furnishings, we are to read. Bring the poor that are cast out of, my, out of thy house. On our wardrobes, we are to see written, as with the finger of God, clothe the naked. In the dining room and on the table laden with abundant food, we are, excuse me, we should see traced. It is not, is it not, to, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, Isaiah 58, 7. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, page 206. So what she's saying to us there, what we have is to be shared. Sure, yes. If we apply the teachings of this lesson to our day, are we spending our money for that which is not bread or our labor for that which does not satisfy, Isaiah 55, 2? 
Aren't self-denial, social kindness, and Sabbath-keeping just as important today as they were in Isaiah's day? We need to remember that we are living in the end-time Day of Atonement, which began in October 22, 1844, and will continue until Jesus returns. The whole, our whole lives are in the Day of Atonement. What does Sabbath keeping mean to you? Do you think of a lot of legalistic law, rules or do you think, do you look forward eagerly to the coming of the Sabbath each week and the rest refreshing and focus on God that it brings? And again, Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Who's that? Yes. Um, the Lord says, if you treat the Sabbath as sacred and do not pursue your own interests on that day, if you value my holy day and honor it by not traveling. You're, you're, you're reading it, the different version. Look at, read this version. Okay. Just to make it more interesting. If because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and honor it desisting from your own ways from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. Notice this, your own, your own, your own, your own. Your own. Yeah. So how can you turn away your foot from your own pleasure on the God's holy day, but at the same time call the Sabbath a delight? Isn't that a contradiction? Would you accept the statement that what God wants for us is the happiest possible lives? Are we willing to follow His will in order to experience that kind of life? Isaiah 55 is unique in Scripture, and we're running out of time here. There's no question about the fact that it suggests that salvation is a free gift, forgiveness is a free gift, God's love is a free gift, God's mercy and grace are free gifts. So how should we respond to God's free gifts? Well, we need to incline our ears, we need to listen. Um, and the word seek in this verse, uh, we, may, we need to close in prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the revelations that we have seen in these passages from Scripture. Help us to realize that the Sabbath is a marvelous, marvelous opportunity for us to celebrate everything you've done for us and celebrate what it means to live your kind of life, to live with you, dwelling humbly with you, and you asking us, you live dwelling humbly with us. What a op marvelous opportunity that would be. May it, it would help us to understand what it will be like to dwell with you for the rest of eternity. Mm. May that day come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.